Jonah chapter 1. Let's clap and thank the worship team for being so great today. Come on, make some noise for the worship team. Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to just read the first, really, three verses of Jonah chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee for Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. In other words, he willingly disobeyed the voice of God. He willingly took out his Amex, swiped, said, I don't need a receipt. I just want to get away from what God has for me. I'm going to go to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I want to preach a message today right down the title, first message of 2020. It's called Runner's High. Runner's High. And really what the title of this whole series that we're going to go through is called Running Toward His Will. I want to look at the book of Jonah because God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, this is what I have for you. Jonah, this is my will for your life. Jonah, this is the vision. This is the dream. This is God's plan for your life. Jonah said, thank you, sir. But no thank you, sir. And ran from the presence of or another way we could say that, is ran from the plan of God. I believe 2020 is a year that is dedicated to running toward God's plan, not away from God's plan. I don't know what the end of last year looked like for you. I don't know what the middle of last year looked like for you. Maybe there was some twists and some turns. Maybe there was some bumps and some bruises. But I want to tell you, this year, 2020, we are starting with our eyes fixed on the prize. We are, uh, we are setting our life toward the plan, the purpose, and the will of God. We are not running away from God. A lot of us, the reason why we run from God is because God has something so great for you, something so significant for you. You're not afraid of failure. You're afraid of the big God thing that he's called you to do. And but remember, God never calls you to something you can do in your own strength. He never calls you to do something you can do in your own power. He always calls you to do something that requires him. He never calls you to do something that's like you without God. It's always you plus God. And so in order for you to walk in his plan and his purpose, you're going to need Jesus. The Bible says in John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you do no good thing. Translation, you need me to do the good thing I've called you to do. In 2020, you don't just want me. In 2020, you need me. In 2020, for you to, I know what I've called you to is, is, is large, it's daunting. I often think if your dreams don't scare you, they're probably not from God. Because God shows up to Jonah, and he's like, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Tell them about me. Jonah's like, <laughs> is there a plan B? And he runs away from the plan of God. I feel like for Zoe, 2020, this is a year of you running toward God's plan. Maybe God whispered his plan into your ear when you were 15. Maybe it was when you were in your early 20s, and maybe you have rejected the will and the plan of God for your life. I believe this is a year for us to turn away. The definition of repentance is not crying at the altar. The definition of repentance is making a U-turn. It's making a 180. So in other words, I was going away from the will and the plan of God, living my own way, doing my own thing. But I heard God called me forward, and so this year I'm running toward his plan. 
You know what 21 days of prayer and fasting is? It's running toward his plan. You know what reading every day in our read-through is? It's running toward his plan. You know what being in the house of God every Sunday is? It's running toward his plan. Being in a connect group is running toward his plan. And I believe that as you run towards God, God's going to run towards you. The book of James says it this way. If we draw near to God, he draws near to us. In other words, when you come running like Forrest Gump, here comes Jesus running into your life. And so we're going to draw near to God in 2020, and we're going to watch God come closer and closer to our lives than ever before. Anybody excited to spend a year with Jesus? Come on, give God a year and watch what he'll do with your life. Run towards God and watch him run towards you. Amen? Come on, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for 2020. We thank you that you crown your year with goodness. Lord, it's a year crowned with faithfulness, crowned with goodness, crowned with mercy. Lord, we declare you are who you say you are. You can do what you said you would do. We pray for 2020. Bless our homes. Bless our children. Bless our church. Bless our city. We thank you for 365 days that we can experience your love and receive your grace. We thank you for it. And God, we thank you that Los Angeles is your favorite city in all of the world. We thank Thank you that you love L.A. more than any other city. Bless our city in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, come on, clap together if you love Los Angeles and you love. Anybody excited to go add value to our city this year? I just want to tell you, not this Saturday, but the next, wait, no, this next Saturday, 16 locations. Let's get out and serve L.A. Come on, we want to make L.A. the best city in the world. Not just a city that tourists love, but a city that locals love. Give me a Pentecostal amen for that. If you don't know what a Pentecostal amen is, it's a long amen. Amen. Are there any runners in the house? Let me just see the runners. Raise your hand if you are a runner. You love to run. Seven people at Zoe love to run. This is encouraging. At least you're honest post the holidays. I love running. In fact, if I if people often ask me, like, well, what, what sports did you do in high school? Like, because they ask because they know I didn't play football. <laughs> like, clearly you didn't play football. What'd you do? Uh, I always say, if I go back to high school, I would have ran cross country. I, I love to run. I love to go out. love to put my, my, my headphones on and just go on like a good five-mile run, six-mile run. This is something that Julie and I have in common. We both love to run. Haven't done it in a few years, but we love to run. It's an amazing feeling. One of the things I love about running, I'm kidding, I haven't done it in... 365 days. But anyways, but but I love to, one of the things I love about running is that anytime anybody goes out and starts running again, the first thing that happens is you want to quit. First thing that happens is about a half a mile in, you're like, I think that's good. I think I'm done right there. I think that's enough. I think, I think that's all I got in me. That's all right. It's a good start. We're going to try it again in a couple weeks. We're going to come back to this. The reality is all of us hit that wall, that quitting point, that we're just like, you're just sucking air. Like, this is harder than I remember. <laughs> but the trick to running is that if you can break through that quitting point and keep running, eventually you're going to experience what they call runner's high. I'm reading the book right now, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. The fantastic story of how Nike came to be. Phil Knight ran for the University of Oregon. And he talks in his book how he would go out on mornings runs. And, and he believes, it's his, he is convinced that the world would be a better place as if every person just went out and ran three miles a day. He's convinced if every, it's not going to happen. <laughs> He's convinced every person in this world would be a better place because of the endorphins because of the high that you get while you run, all of a sudden you get a high that money can't buy. All of a sudden you get a high where you're like, oh, I could do this for another hour. I'm not going to, but I'm saying I could. There's something about going on a run and breaking through your quitting point. Hear me today. In 2020, a quitting point is coming. 
It could have to do with relationship. It could have to do with sin. It could have to do with finance. But a quitting point is coming. But I want to dedicate right from the first Sunday of this year that we're going to receive runners high because we're going to run toward the plan and the will of God for our life. Come on, we're going to run toward his plan and we're not going to stop until we fulfill what he's called us to do. Oh, I love this about God. It says in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This signifies what we always talk about at Zoe, that we serve the God that initiates. Remember, God is going to knock on your door. God is going to initiate vision. God is going to show up. I, pr I promise you, what's coming your way is a word from God, an unction from the Holy Spirit, a word in season. It'll be a phrase. It could be a picture. It could be an image. It could be a message. It doesn't matter what it is, but a word is coming from God. Write down number one. Here's why. Because God loves to show you what's next. God loves to show you what's next. Here's what's next for your life. This wasn't the first time God has spoken to Jonah, and it won't be the last time God speaks to Jonah. This was the next thing God had for Jonah. I want to encourage you. God spoke something great to you in 2019, but a new word's coming in 2020. A fresh word from heaven. A fresh uh, marching order. A fresh vision. Something I'm telling you, because God loves to tell you this is what's next. That was awesome. That was great. That's what I had for you. But in this new year, I need you to walk in this. In this new year, I need forgiveness. In this new year, we need freedom. In this new year, I need generosity. In this new year, I need entrepreneurship. In this new year, I need you to be planted. In this new year, I need you to read the word. What's the next thing that God has for you? At Zoe, we always believe there's a next step. That's why the mission of our church, if you're wondering what Zoe is about, what's Zoe about? Zoe is about a next step. We want people in Los Angeles to know God. Not the God of religion, but the God of relationship. We want people to know God and we want people to find freedom. Because there's a lot of people that know God, but are still bound and addicted to sin. So just because you know God does not mean you're free. So we want the next step to be knowing God, to finding freedom. I wonder if this will be the year in 2020 if you get free from that addiction that nobody knows about. This will be the year you're free from that bitterness and that envy that you've held on to. Come on, we want people to know God and find freedom and discover their gift. Which is bigger than discovering your Enneagram number. Not much bigger, but bigger. Your next step is discovering why you exist on this earth. Why did God make you that way? Why do you have that temperament and that personality and the way your mind works? You've got to get, you got to get comfortable in your own skin. So you've got to know God and find freedom, discover your gift, and then go make a difference. Everyone has a next step, and God shows up to Jonah, and he says, Jonah, here's your next step. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to tell them about how awesome I am. I wonder what your next step is. God has a next step for you. He always does. He shows up to Moses, and he says, here's your next step. Go talk to Pharaoh. Get my people free. He shows up to David. He said, your next step, go build me a house. He showed up to Noah. He said, Noah, your next step, build me an ark. He shows up all throughout the Bible and he says this is your next step this is your next step this is your I wonder what God's saying to you in 2020 what your next step is and if you're wondering like ah, I struggle and I don't ever hear a next step a lot of times we can't get the next step until we complete the first step in other words, God's not going to tell you anything new until you go back and do the last thing he told you to do. So until you can fulfill what God has already spoken to you, you can't get the next thing that God has. God loves to tell you the next step, but we got to be faithful to be obedient to the voice of our God. Anybody down to walk in what God says and the direction of the purposes and the plans that he has for your life? Come on, give him a loud clap if you're thankful that we serve the God that shows up and says, this is what I have. So he says, Jonah, son of Amittai, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to tell them, bring them a message 
bring them a message of my love and my grace and my plans and my purposes. Go tell Nineveh of my greatness. Go be a representative. Go be a messenger. Jonah, I'm sending you to Nineveh. That nation is wicked. That nation doesn't know me. That nation has turned against me. I need you to go and tell them about me. The thing I love about the book of Jonah is much like Jonah, you and I are messengers. Whether you realize it or not, your job, once you become a Christian or a believer in Jesus, you are now a messenger. In fact, write down number two. You're a messenger of grace. You're a messenger of grace. You've got a message to give. You've got something to offer this world. You've got a message that's got to come out of you. Watch here what the scriptures say. Go here to the first verse. I want to show you a couple verses to prove to you. Look here in the first one, the book of Luke. Oh, sorry, Matthew chapter 5. It says, your lives are like salt among the people. But if you, like salt, become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and will be thrown out and trampled on by others. Your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance, for how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who would light a lamp and then hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's placed where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. Oh, I love this about God. He is saying that you are salt. You are light. And when you walk in our city, when you go to restaurants, to Starbucks, when you go to your workplace and in your neighborhood, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are carrying a precious message. I want to tell you you're a messenger of good news. You're a messenger of hope. And some people might not ever read a Bible, but they're going to read your life. And they will know that God is good and God is real by your love by your grace, by the message that you portray. A lot of us have to understand, we are just like Jonah. We're a messenger of purpose. We're a, me listen, God, the Bible says, could have had you been born in any era. God could have had you live in any century. But all the times that men exist on the earth have appointed, been appointed by God. God, if he wanted to, could have you live anywhere in the world. If God wanted you to live in a different continent or a different country or a different city, he could do that in just a moment. But God has you here and God has you now. God has you in the city of angels. God has you in the greatest city on the planet. And we are to be messengers, not of bad news, but we are messengers of of good news. Come on, somebody in L.A., give God a praise today. Come on, I'm not a messenger of hell, doom, gloom, bad news. You're going to hell. I'm a messenger of hope. I'm a messenger of heaven. I'm a messenger of grace. I'm a messenger of the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, I love this about John the Baptist. If you don't know much about the Bible, there's a guy that came right before Jesus, and he kind of dressed weird and acted weird. And he was a little bit strange, but the Bible says he was a voice, a voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. He, was, he had a message from God. Watch what this message was. Put it up there in the book of Luke. I love this. The truth, so that everyone everywhere will, will be ready to see the life of God. Every twisted thing in your life must be made straight. Every dark way must be brought into the light. Wrongs righted, injustices removed. Every heart of pride will be humbled low before him. Every deception will be exposed and replaced. By this was to fulfill what was written in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Listen, you will hear a thunderous voice in the lonely wilderness telling you to wake up and get your heart ready for the coming of the Lord Jehovah. You know, I know it doesn't look like it. I know it's kind of strange for you to walk into your office and sit at your cubicle and for you to kind of carry a wake up message. But you're a messenger. I worked at this church in Seattle years ago and this lady moved from Mexico to our church. And the, the lady in Mexico, the pastor knew our pastor. And so she came from Mexico and she asked some of the staff if she could deliver a, a message to the pastor from the pastor in Mexico. So she comes to our pastor, 
She doesn't speak English very well. She just moved here. She's straight from Mexico. Just, I mean, just maybe a week living in the United States of America. She gets to the pastor. They let her in the back. They get, she gets to the pastor. She says to the pastor, she says, Pastor, I have a massage for you. And the pastor was like, excuse me? <laughs> Girlfriend, I'm good. <laughs> you may feel like, I don't know how to give this message. I don't know how to walk out this truth. I'm not the best at delivering messages. It's not about what you say audibly. Your actions are speaking so loud, we can't hear a word that you're saying. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, and you are carrying with you a message of hope. He wasn't sending Jonah. In fact, we'll see it in the end of the book. Jonah, in the end, will eventually do God's will. In the end, he'll go to Nineveh. In the end, he'll deliver a message of hope. In the end, Nineveh will have revival. In the end, all of Nineveh will get saved. And in the end, Jonah will be like, see, that's why I didn't want to come here. Because I know how good and how loving and great you are. Jonah rebelled against God because he didn't want to see these people get saved. He knew the message of hope. He knew the God of grace. He knew the God of forgiveness. He knew the God of compassion. He didn't even want them to experience the goodness and the grace of God. Come on, you and I at Zoe, we want people to experience grace. We want people to see Jesus. We want people to understand forgiveness. Come on, clap right now. If you're down to be a messenger of hope, come on, they don't need to hear about how bad they are. They need to hear about how good he is in fact what I love about God is this Jonah Jonah's like I'm not going to them I don't this this is like this is like in our era this is like God saying I want you to go to San Francisco and tell all those people about how good I am he's like nah and he, he gets into a boat to go to San Diego he's like I'm not going to San Francisco eventually when he goes down to San Diego and he's on the boat all of a sudden a storm breaks out and all of a sudden the, the, the boat starts rocking and some of the crew on the boat were like hey hey this is not a normal storm this what's happening here is not somebody in this this thing sin somebody remember some of you need to understand some of the storms that are happening in your life are a direct result because of somebody that's on your boat that's causing a storm you got to identify who is it in my life that's causing something to go crazy I need to boop, boop. what are you saying pastor you need some boop, boop in 2020 so they're like, this is not normal. This, this, this is crazy. The storm's going crazy. And so they knew it was Jonah. So they come out and they're like, Jonah, is it you, man? Are you causing the storm? And Jonah's like, my bad, man. I'm supposed to be in San Francisco, but I came to San Diego. And I just, I just I don't know what I'm doing in San Diego. I'm supposed to be in San Francisco. And they're like, hey, man, we, I, no hard feelings, but boop, boop. And they get rid of him. <laughs> now Jonah's in the water. He's fresh out being thrown off the boat. He's in the water. And the Bible says, I love God so much. And the Bible says God sends a whale to come capture Jonah. Jonah spends three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. I want to tell you what God is doing. Write down number three. He is purifying the messenger. Because listen, Jonah's like you and I. Jonah's got mixed vision and mixed emotions and mixed decisions and mixed inability to do God's will. And so God, don't worry. If you're all mixed up, don't worry. God will send a storm and God will send a whale. And he's not doing it because he's mad. He's not doing it because he's disappointed. He's doing it because he's about to purify the intentions and the motives of your heart. Somebody thank him right now. When I'm all wrong, he's going to get me right. Come on, give him a shout. Give him a praise in 2020. He's going to purify me. God's just purifying you. Some of you going through hell on earth. You're starting 2020 off like, really, God? How can I make a resolution? I'm in hell. God is using your hell to do a mighty work in your life. He is purifying your motives. He is purifying your intentions. He is molding you and shaping you and rearranging you. He is using the circumstance that you're in right now to develop the person he sees in your future. And listen, if you, he's not going to let you skate by and just, just roll by and be all good. No, he wants to do a mighty work because he sees something better. Remember, you can't have gold until you go through the refiner's fire. And so sometimes God will put you in a storm and he'll put you in the belly of the whale so he can purify the messenger. 
the message needs no changing. The message is an everlasting truth. The message has been tried and tested for thousands of years. The message needs no alteration. The messenger needs some molding. The messenger needs some chiseling. The messenger needs some, some heart construction and some mind alteration. So he uses storms. And isn't it amazing? And when you turn away from God and you're like, I ain't doing God's will. I'm going to do my I'm gonna do, ride or die all with me. I'm going do, to do me, boo. And how's that working out for you? And you, ever, you, you start going through stuff and then you go to bed at night and you're like, ah, uh, am I causing the storm? Am I? Because I'd love to blame somebody else on the boat, but I, according to my conscience, I think, I think I'm the one messing up. I think, I think, I think this is, whew, this is, this is sobering. All the storms and the whales, hmm. Maybe I should turn to God. Isn't it so interesting? I don't know if you're like me, but. I find that sometimes I need to be stuck in a whale for me to turn to God. It's when everything's quiet and everything's dark and everything's, well, I have no other options, you know. And I'm in the whale and I'm like, God, will you forgive me? Because my pride got in the way. And I thought I was big enough to go, San Francisco. More like San Diego. God's like, no, you, you can try, but my purposes will prevail. My, my, my plans. The Bible says, many plans does a man have in his own heart. But the Lord, his plans are always established. And so sometimes I have to understand that God's not sending whales after me because he's mad at me. Religion's always like, that's what you get, you know. <laughs> told you it's what you get sinner <laughs> yeah it's what you get you deserve it maybe a better way to look at this would be like God is so gracious and God is so good that he captures me that when I could have been destroying my life over here in Tarshish and found some club in Tarshish, that God was so great that he protected me and he put me in a whale. We're not going to let you go into San Diego. Gas lamp district is very dangerous. <laughs> oh, I love Psalm 51. Watch here on the screen, Psalm 51. Purify my conscience. Make this leper clean again. Wash me in your love until I am pure in heart. Satisfy me in your sweetness and my song of joy will return. The places within me you have crushed will rejoice in your healing touch. I wonder if that's what Jonah was praying. God, cleanse this leper. Heal me. Touch me with your healing touch. Do a mighty, God, I'm sorry. I repent. God, forgive me. I'll do it your way. When the, I, by the way, and God can get you to where he wants you to be. He redirected the whale. The whale showed up where? Uh, in Nineveh. Put him on the shore. Jonah got up out the belly of a whale, smelling like whale, and all of a sudden started preaching and running toward the plan of God. He got a runner's high because he was running toward the plan of God and all of a sudden Nineveh gets saved and revival gets saved there is the difference between your plan and God's plan his ways and your ways clap if you're down to submit and surrender to the plan and the will of God in your life <laughs> worship team you come join me I love this right down number four God always has a rescue plan God always has a rescue plan 
I don't know if you feel twisted and you feel tormented and you feel like you're in storms in the bellies of whales. I want to give you good news right now. He's got a rescue plan. There is no place you've gone that is too far from the grace of God. There is nothing you've done that is too far away from the grace of our God. There is nothing you have smoked, touched, or looked at that is too far away from the grace of my God. And if you, you rebel, don't you worry. He controls whales. He controls storms. You are not in control. He's got a rescue plan. I was thinking about that movie when I think about rescue plans. I was thinking about that old movie, The Fugitive, with Tommy Lee Jones. Harrison Ford escapes prison, and, and Tommy Lee Jones is standing there, and he's like, we want to do the whole rescue mission. We want every dog house and every outhouse and every lighthouse. We're going to search high and low. I wonder if you realize that when you try and escape the goodness of God, God sends out the rescue team. He's listening, I'm going I'm I'm to use my messengers that are right. I'm going to use my messengers that are all running towards his plan. I'm going to use my messengers that do have a runner's high. And I'm going to go after you. And I'm going to love you. And you, you listen, listen, it's not because I'm mad at you. I've just got better than you've got. I've just got a bigger dream and a bigger plan and a bigger purpose and a bigger passion and a bigger identity. And you, your plans are small next to mine. So just a heads up, I've got a rescue plan and I can use it whenever and however I want to. David wandered. David needed some rescuing. 40 years King David reigned. 20 years were awesome. 20 years were bad. Split in the middle by an affair and a murder. King David starts wandering from the plans. He stops running toward the plan of God. He starts taking matters into his own hands. And David comes to his senses. And he writes this beautiful verse in Psalm 119, verse 175. You know you love Jesus when you write 175 verses. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. I've done it again, God. I don't know how I got down here into San Diego. I don't know how I knew you told me. I heard you loud and clear. And yet somehow I got off the treadmill and I got back in my car. Somehow I stopped running to the plan and the will of God for my life. And God, I got sidetracked and I got caught up in sin. Good news. He sends whales because he loves them. It's not a whale of anger. It's a whale of redemption. It's a whale that signifies, I'm not done with you yet. You might turn your back on me, but I'll never turn my back on you. You might commit to going against my plan, but I will never change the plan I have for your life. Eventually, Jonah comes back to his senses. God rescues him, puts him right smack dab in the middle of God's vision. You know, this could be the year that your life ends up in the Nineveh that God has for you. Think about that. This could be the year that you don't live with such torment, such guilt, such shame, such condemnation, knowing full well, I know I'm supposed to be running towards His plan. I actually know His plan. Because God loves you so much. He's told you what's next. By the way, if he hasn't told you what's next, get ready. Because in the next 21 days, the word of the Lord's coming. I heard someone say this a long time ago. You never have to ask God to speak. God always wants to speak. All you need to ask for is strength to hear his voice. Amen. And I believe that as we run towards his will. God's going to show us. He's going to lead us. He's going to guide us. Every year has highs and lows. Every year has wins and losses. 
every year has success and failure. Every year, I gotta be honest, 2019, I've never felt like quitting before. First time in my life I ever felt like, maybe I should just quit. Every time I break through quitting points, every time I'm not defined by my wins or losses, I just keep running toward his plan. The high is not an achievement. The low is not in failure. The high you're looking for is running toward his plan. January, anybody could be in church in January. I saw this tweet. This guy was like, yo, if you're mad that your gym is mad full for the next two weeks, don't worry. February's coming. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to be in the gym. What's the difference? Commitment. And what we're saying as a church, I'm committed. I'm committed in every season. I'm committed in the winter and the spring and the summer and the fall. I'm going to be just as faithful in January as I am in June. I'm going to run in July like I will in November. Come on, Zoe, if you're down to run towards his plan, if you're down to run towards the will of God, come on, give him a clap and seal your commitment to Jesus.